For blood test number four in 2023, we saw that my biological age, using Dr. Morgan Levine's biological age calculator, PhenoAge, was about 16 years younger than my chronological. Similarly, when using aging.ai, it was about 19 years younger. So what may be contributing to these data? Let's start off by taking a look at supplements. So first, I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my 20s, so I've been taking levothyroxine every day since then. Also, in the non-summer months, I supplement with 1,000 IUs of vitamin D, and for the 72-day period that corresponded to this blood test, and more specifically, that period, that 72-day period, started after blood test number three on April 24th and went through the day before blood test number four on July 4th. So that period is 72 days. Of those 72 days, I supplemented with vitamin D for 67 days. As the other five days, I was able to get full body sun exposure. In terms of other supplements, I also took serine, supplemental serine, and vitamin B6, or pyridoxal 5-phosphate, P5P, 4.1 grams of serine per day, and 36.3 milligrams of vitamin B6 per day. I doubled the serine intake when compared with test number three, and I tripled the B6 intake from 12 milligrams per day to 36 milligrams per day for vitamin B6. And I did that to try to, try to potentially reduce homocysteine, and I'll uh, provide an update on that in an upcoming video. I also took grapeseed powder, 6.1 grams per day for 19 of the 72 days in this period to potentially impact NAD. And I already showed that data on, on the channel. If you missed that video, it, it'll be in the right corner. For the nine days before this blood test, I also supplemented with niacin or nicotinic acid, 600 milligrams per day. And that was also to try to impact NAD. And that will be the next video coming on Sunday. So that's it for supplements, uh, which brings us to diet. What diet composition corresponds to test number four? And again, this will be my average daily dietary intake over that 72-day period that corresponds to test number four. And that's what we can see here. So I've ranked these foods from one to 50 in terms of highest amount in grams to lowest amount at number 50. Uh, so the list is all in grams with the exception of green tea at number 22, which is in ounces. Now, if you're familiar with the channel, you should note that these foods and amounts have been purposefully consistent in 2023 over the first four tests. And that's because after 40 plus blood tests since 2015, this diet, including macros and micros and diet composition, is consistently associated with relatively youthful biomarker data, uh, in my case, including Levine's phenoage, Dunedin Pace epigenetic aging, aging.ai, but there are a few exceptions, which I'm currently working on, including Horvath's epigenetic test, DHEA sulfate, and homocysteine. Now, the diet isn't always clean. I do include cheat meals, but very occasionally, as I'm technically a recovering junk foodaholic. So I've got to be very careful with how often that I include junk food in the, in the diet before I start thinking about it all the time. And what works for me is at most two cheat meals per, uh, for, per period in between blood tests. For this, for this test, it was only one cheat meal, which I included Nutella, <clears throat> which that's not 2.1 grams per day. That was 150 grams immediately after the blood test and then nothing for the other 71 days that were in this 72-day period. Now, if we look at how many calories Nutella provided, which was 809, that's 0.5% of all calories consumed during this 72-day period. So it's 99.5% clean, 0.5% junk. All right, so this list is this list is ranked in grams. Which foods are top contributors for calories? And that's what we can see here. And note that this plot is, is generated with chronometer. I track my diet with chronometer. And if you're interested in doing the same, there'll be a discount link in the video's description. Atop the list in terms of calories, shouldn't be a surprise if you're familiar with the channel. It's once again sardines. And then for the remaining nine foods, it's the same as what I sh I've shown in earlier videos from for test one to three with a slightly different uh, order, but the same top, top 10 foods as again, the overall diet composition, this overall diet composition is associated with my relatively youthful data. So I don't wanna blow up the system, at best only small tweaks. All right, what about macronutrient composition? How does that correspond to test number four? So first starting with calorie intake, my average daily calorie intake was 2145, which again, if you're familiar with the channel, you've seen me saying, saying this a lot over the last few videos. This, this too is 2145 is my lowest average daily calorie intake since I started tracking diet in April of 2015. And the previous low was 2174 on the last test for blood test number three. Now, as a quick side note, note that I've been making very small calorie cuts, 20 to 30 calories per day, test over test, 
not 20 to 30 calories per day sequentially every single day, but an average of 20 to 30 calories. For example, 2174 average for test number three versus 2145, that's about a 30 calorie cut. And that approach has resulted in sustained weight loss over time in contrast with the years in the past where I try to cut 500 to 1,000 calories per day and lose weight slash fat very quickly, but then binge it back on. So using this approach of very small calorie cuts over a long period of time, that's resulted in sustained weight loss, which is what we'll see here. So here's my calorie intake from October of 2020 through July of 2023. And note that each blue dot equals the average daily calorie intake that corresponds to a blood test, and there are 19 blood tests over this period. So initially, in October of 2020, my body weight was 154 pounds, whereas now it's 145 pounds, and I've been able to keep it off without having any reversions uh, you know, back, going back towards higher body weights because for whatever reason for me, smaller calorie cuts, again, are easier to maintain over a long period of time. And again, note this, this is probably mostly fat loss as my workouts are almost completely standardized in terms of sets, reps, and weights, and movements that I do, and there's been no loss of strength during that period. All right, let's go back to macronutrient composition and take a look at protein intake, which was about 99 grams per day, about 18% of total calories. Now let's take a look at fat intake, which is shown here. Average daily fat intake was 80, about 80 grams per day, which is 33.6% of total calories. And if you're interested in the fat breakdown, including monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, omega-3, 6, saturated, trans fats, and cholesterol, that's, that's shown here too. All right, next up, let's take a look at carbohydrate intake. And that's what's shown here. So total carbs were about 296 grams per day, which seems like a lot, but note that net carbs equals total carbs minus fiber. Average daily fiber intake for this test that corresponded to the 72-day period for this test was about 86 grams per day. So when subtracting that from total carbs, we get a net carbs of about 212 grams per day. When multiplying net carbs by four calories per gram, we get a 39.5% of my diet being or coming from net carbs. Now note that fiber does provide calories. That's because all fiber is not the same. You've got insoluble fiber, which is generally poorly fermentable, and you have soluble fiber, which is fermented by gut bacteria into short chain fatty acids or SCFAs. In other words, soluble fiber is converted into fat. So then when multiplying 2.2 times about 86, those 189 calories from fiber which is 8.8% of my total calorie intake during this period can be, or 8% or of my daily calorie intake can be added to total fat. And then we can see what my net macros are that correspond to my fourth blood test in 2023. It's about 42% fat, about 40% net carbs, and about 18% protein. And note that I didn't start off with these macros in mind. I follow the blood biomarkers in terms of correlations with diet. I change the diet and then reevaluate every time I blood test, and that's how I've settled on this diet. I haven't started with a pre-existing idea of what diet I should be on. I let the biomarkers guide me. And it's been a while since I've shown that approach, so I, I'm planning on doing a live stream probably in late August, so stay tuned for that, where we'll look at correlations between diet with blood biomarkers. All right, so I also track uh, sugar intake, but more specifically, total fructose. And that, that's because in my data, Total fructose is significantly correlated with more blood biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. So for this test, total fructose intake, and note that sucrose is half fructose, so dividing sucrose by two plus fructose equals total fructose, and in this case, it was 58, about 58 grams per day, an average of 58 grams per day that corresponded to this test. And that may seem like a lot, but that's close to my lowest fructose intake since starting diet tracking in 2015, with my lowest being 57 and a half grams per day. Note that I've had fructose, total fructose intakes of about 115 grams per day. So this is about, that it's about half that is progress, albeit not perfection. All right, what about micronutrients? So let's start off with vitamins. And uh, it may be hard to see because I wanted to get all the vitamins on the screen. So you may have to go full screen if you haven't already to see all the vitamin levels. Some things to note is that there's full RDA coverage. So I think for anyone that's starting on this journey of trying to optimize blood biomarkers through uh, at least in part diet, if not exercise, sleep, supplements, et cetera. At the very least, I think full RDA coverage for all vitamins and minerals is a good starting point. But then also note that many of my micronutrients are purposely higher than the RDA, and that's because I'm following correlations with blood biomarkers. And I won't go into that in, in this video. I've covered that uh, at some length in earlier videos. What I do want to point out is that my average niacin intake was, was about 117 milligrams per day, 
the RDA is 15 milligrams per day. And although I was at 40 milligrams per day, which is two and a half fold the RDA, I've increased niacin with the goal of potentially increasing NAD. So again, stay tuned for that video as that's coming next. Last but not least, we've got mineral intake. And that's all for now. If you're interested in more of my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for at-home metabolomics, NAD quantification, green tea, epigenetic testing, or microbiome composition, at-home blood testing with CyFox Health. And note that their panel is almost exclusively different from the at-home metabolomics, especially since it includes ApoB, diet tracking, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.